So, so please. Oh, sorry. We have a poll up right now for you to participate as you're signing into our webinar. Uh, I do see that we have people continuing to sign in. So we're really interested in what your summer travel plans are. And if you're traveling, where you're going, are you going internationally? Are you going into the remote regions of British Columbia? So please go ahead while we're waiting for uh, everybody to sign into the webinar this afternoon to answer our poll. Currently, it looks like Vancouver Coast and Mountain regions is in the lead with 54%. And then we have an enthusiastic 2% going into that gorgeous Caribou Chilcotin Coast region. We have the Vancouver Island and then the Thompson Okanagan coming in at 26%. Uh, I think all of us are dreaming of travel, uh, both within British Columbia, Canada, and then for destinations uh, that are a little longer haul internationally. So thank you very much as you're signing in for answering our poll. Again, my name is Ingrid Jarrett, President and CEO of the BC Hotel Association. I'm delighted to bring you our Summer Industry Outlook uh, virtual event. Uh, I'll just do a little bit of um, housekeeping. This will be recorded and it will be available for you uh, following uh, the presentations today. Um, please submit in your Q&A function at the bottom of your screen any questions that you may have for our panelists. And I'd like to thank those of you who did submit questions. We're going to do our best to answer those questions during our panel discussion. And any questions that we're unable to answer, uh, please make sure that you reach out directly to us at BC Hotel Association. We're, we're very committed to making sure we connect you with the right person. So we're seeing uh, Vancouver Coast and Mountains. So that's Vancouver, Lower Mainland, Whistler as the number one uh, driver for summer travel from those of you that are on the webinar, followed by uh, Vancouver Island, not surprising. I know Vancouver Island had very, very strong uh, summer demand last year and the year before, uh, closely followed by the Thompson Okanagan, and then outside of BC and Canada coming in at 16%, so a little bit more long haul, uh, followed by the Kootenai Rockies and the Caribou Chilcotin Coast. Thank you to all of you for answering our poll. I'd like to now acknowledge that I'm coming to you today from the Versante Hotel, gorgeous hotel in Richmond on the uh, unceded and ancestral territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. And these three nations have been stewarding this land from time immemorial. Uh, I'm delighted to be hosted today by the team at the Versante Hotel and really appreciate our opportunity to live, work, and play while we're here in Richmond. We have a couple of slides at the beginning of our webinar based on the enormous number of questions that we had from you around uh, labor shortages and workforce. So um, the first thing I'd like to do is just highlight for you some of the work that we are doing in leading a workforce recovery strategy. We've spent a lot of time on recruitment, both domestic and international. We've been working with partners on upskilling, training with uh, education providers such as uh, the Western Community College, develop partnerships with hospitality schools, international students. We also have agreements with hospitality programs in process. And then we also, given that we know there's not enough British Columbians or Canadians to fill those positions, have done an enormous amount of work, uh, both federally and provincially on uh, LMIA work, uh, accessing uh, displaced people, uh, also working uh, with international uh, partners on fast tracking and developing pilot projects, 
Uh, we also are working both provincially and federally with connecting Ukrainian refugees, which of course is on everybody's mind right now. And we've also signed two uh, MOUs with the Consulate of Barbados and El Salvador, where we have an agreement to fast track skilled and career hospitality workers in all positions. So if you have an LMIA or if you're interested in accessing some of those trained and skilled uh, workers, please reach out to us directly. And here's your new best friend when it comes to recruitment. Uh, Alison Langford is, uh, has joined our team earlier this year is a professional immigration consultant and Allison has worked with the hotel sector for many years and really is responsible for being able to connect potential employees and skilled workers for you and the hotels. Please reach out to Allison directly, allison at bcha.com. She can also help you with some of the companies that are reaching out to help you with recruitment. There is all kinds of different companies and different ways that they bill and charge for this, uh, this expertise. It's really important that you are confirming the companies are reputable, that you're paying uh, the appropriate amounts, and that the, at the end of the day, you're successful. Please don't hell hesitate to reach out to Allison. She'll definitely be there to make sure to support you. And now I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our three panelists. Allison McKay, Acting Vice President, Destination Management, Destination BC. Allison, thank you so much for joining us. I'm just delighted to have you here. And Russell, Russell Atkinson, Director of Air Service Development for the Vancouver Airport Authority. My goodness, planes and travel and air is on everybody's minds right now. Thank you so much for joining us. And Carrie Russell, Senior Managing Partner with HVS. Carrie and I go back many, many years. And Carrie, I know your insights and intel and expertise will be of great value today. Thank you to the three of you for joining us. So let's start off. What is on the horizon for the summer season? Again, please go ahead and uh, put your questions in the Q&A. Um, I know that when we're looking at what is on everybody's mind, um, and what are we really looking at for the summer season? And I'd like to just go and provide each of you an opportunity for you to give just that snapshot of an insight. What are you projecting uh, for the 2022, not just the summer, but 2022, the remainder? Allison, can we start with you? Of course, wonderful. Well, thank you, Ingrid, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. As, as Ingrid said, uh, my name's Allison. I could be your second new best friend if you'd like, but uh, what an amazing uh, skill set and expertise that you have uh, access to with the BC Hospitality or Hotel Association. Um, but certainly, um, I think at Destination BC, after two years of, of COVID restrictions, I can optimistically share that we have certainly been seeing and hearing about some significant pent up travel demand. Um, you've probably heard this before. You may even yourself be experiencing this, experiencing this, but Expedia has been calling this year 2022, uh, the year of the GOAT, which is the greatest of all time trips. People are looking forward to traveling again. And what we've been seeing is that they're ready to go big on their next holiday. Our international markets have been returning uh, and Destination BC, we, we've been working really hard through our marketing and with our partners to capitalize on that demand. Um, back in March, launching a $6.7 million global, it's so wonderful to say that word again, global marketing campaign, which is working to assure international visitors in our key markets that British Columbia has what they are seeking and we are ready, ready to welcome them. So it's an exciting day, um, happy day for us uh, as an industry. Uh, right here also in BC, what we've been seeing is that our residents are still very eager to explore our own province. Uh, we've been tracking uh, through some BC resident research all throughout the pandemic. And we're seeing about 77% of the respondents, I think echoed in the poll that we started off with as well, that are intending to travel to nearby communities within the next three months. Um, 
looking over the majority are intending to travel elsewhere in BC overnight. Uh, so there will be this will be key for areas of the province who do often rely a little bit more heavily on the domestic visitation as opposed to the international visitation. And we have been seeing through our research and analytics, analytics and the work that they do that this pent up demand that we've been seeing and hearing is translating into bookings for BC. So for the week of May 2nd, uh, what we've seen is our provincial occupancy rate has been up 38 points versus the same week last year. Domestic visitation has been up 147% versus the same week last year. And I know Rita Russell will be speaking to these points later, but air bookings to BC have been soaring. We know that while travel demand is also soaring, it's a huge and positive step for our industry. industry. We also know it's not necessarily a case of immediate recovery in all parts of the province. We continue to face issues, gas prices, labor challenges that have the potential to impact the summer travel season and beyond. But here at Destination BC, uh, we're committed to continuing to monitor um, and to help inform our industry and just be ready to shift and, and uh, shift our plans if needed. So that's Great. what we're seeing on that summer horizon. Thank you so much, Allison. There's some really encouraging trends uh, that you're seeing from the research. So thank you for that. And Carrie, Carrie uh, any insights that you'd like to share from, uh, from your uh, research as well and any trends maybe that you're identifying? Yeah, I think we're, we're finally seeing the numbers um, turn around to the point where we can, we can have visibility to the true recovery. Uh, you know, we've been we've been sitting in front of these numbers for two years since mid March of 2020, watching the weekly numbers, and you know we were down to single digits in some markets for occupancies, and we were we we did have bounce backs. You know, we had some decent numbers in August and, and decent areas, but um, you know at this point the uh, the stats that came out for the month of April yesterday from Smith Travel Research Canada wide, we had. Uh, an actual increase in average rate. So the increase in, in rate Canada wide was up two and a half percent. The Western part of the country, BC specifically, is, is really driving some of that. The rate in the April of 2022 compared to April 2019, because we're, we're constantly going back to what were we, where we had at our peak, uh, was, was 5.7%. So if you look at you know January Red Park compared to 2019 was down 30%. February was down 15%. March, we tipped. We were actually slightly higher in, B in BC for rev par growth. And April, we were up 5.3% for rev par growth. So I, I, you know, I can only expect that these trends are continuing through the summer. I think that we've felt a, a real change in people's perception about um, the, just travel and, and, uh, and their comfort level with it in general. I think the, the sixth wave of, of Omicron um, and, and just the fact that we, we had experience with it. So many more people had contracted it. They had uh, uh, now were, were sort of familiar with what to expect, although, you know, there's still health challenges out there, but I think they've kind of put this more in a, in a different mode that their um, desire to travel and, and comfort level with travel exceeds their fear of travel. Um, and now the, the numbers are, are really, really changing. So, you know, I'm, I'm very optimistic for the summer. Um, I, I think that we'll continue to exceed 2019 growth um, or continue to exceed the numbers for from 2019 throughout the summer. I guess that the fall becomes a bit more of a question mark because we shift from leisure demand looking more towards group demand and uh, and that corporate market. And um, and quite frankly, I think the corporate market has been a bit of a surprise that it, uh, it hasn't come back. Um, and... Uh, uh, you know, at, at some point, I think it, it needs to, um, and hopefully that's this fall. But uh, yeah, no, excited about the summer and, uh, and cautiously optimistic about the fall. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. I know that we're seeing a real lag in the return of government travel, corporate travel, and large group travel. And, you know, as, as we look at that and analyze the reasons for that, there's always a lead time and a booking window that's so different from that leisure, you know, oh, I think I'll go somewhere. And you're thinking about that on Tuesday and you leave on Friday. And we know that the planning for the corporate market and the recovery is certainly lagging. Uh, you know, we're, we're hearing pace in different destinations that there's 
strength on the books and that we're seeing a real uh, positive trend moving forward, but it hasn't materialized yet. Not sure if that's a lag post COVID or whether or not there's still that hesitancy where corporations aren't encouraging people, get back to the office, we need to travel, let's go and meet in different destinations. Um, Russell, and for you, uh, your insights currently from an air perspective, which we know is the gateway to British Columbia. You know, we really look to YVR and, and air because the ripple effect to every corner of the province is so evident and, and trackable. Uh, so please do tell us your insights and what your, you know, what your crystal ball is telling you for summer and the rest of 2022. All right, thanks, Ingrid. I'll, I'll pick up on uh, some of the stuff Allison and Carrie were saying. We're certainly starting to see a bit of a hockey stick recovery at YVR. So when I think back to the depths of the pandemic and 3,000 passengers a day at uh, YVR, our, our uh, terminals were looking awfully empty. But we were just coming off a few uh, days this week where we were over 50,000 passengers a day, so making a lot of progress. There, we're projecting uh, over the weekend to be up around 55,000 passengers a day. So, it, so we are certainly starting to see a return of travel, and, and it, it gets even better when we look out into the summer. So, when we look at uh, the airline seat capacity loaded uh, for this summer, domestically we're loaded at 101% of what we had in summer 2019. So, on the domestic front, Allison, as you were saying, we, we, we're going to have a, a bunch of uh, a Canadian capacity. Uh, trans borders coming back strong. So when we're, we're looking at uh, what's loaded uh, for US uh, destinations and routes this summer, it's at 82%. Um, and then international is lagging a little bit at 63%. And that is, of course, because of things like the, um, the zero COVID policies in China. Um, so greater China is a bit slow in recovery, but we are seeing some really important markets like Australia, the UK, uh, Germany, uh, Japan, uh, Seoul, uh, bouncing back good. So, so we are seeing, we are seeing some some really positive signs there. Um, and of course, I, I, I'm sure uh, some folks have been seeing in the news with the return of capacity and return of passengers and, and this hockey stick uh, recovery that we're seeing. There are some challenges that that's putting on our operations as well. So, much like the uh, the hotel sector, we have some staffing challenges and things uh, that we're dealing with. But overall, I'm quite optimistic about what we're seeing for the summer now. As Carrie said, as we head into the fall, um, the schedules again are loaded quite strong, but we are preparing ourselves. We're not, you know, we are aware that COVID has not left us and then we do need to prepare for uncertainty as we head into the fall. Um, but all, on the whole, I'm quite optimistic about the summer and, and hopefully we, we continue that momentum through the fall and into the winter season as well. And Russell, are you seeing when you look at the horizon, any new airlines or new destinations? Are you seeing new routes? Uh, I know that uh, in Europe, we're seeing a real rebound very early uh, in the low cost airlines. And now there's a couple of new charters bubbling up and a couple of new destinations. So um, how, how is that playing out when you look at the recovery for the remainder of the year? And, and beyond. Yeah, well, I'm glad you asked because there's some actually really good news stories. So um, one of the ones I'm really excited about is Air Canada is launching Austin, Texas uh, in the next couple of weeks here. So that's a destination that we've been really keen on for a long time for a whole bunch of reasons, uh, connections between our respective technology sectors, but arts and culture. Um, so it's really glad to see Air Canada not just rebuilding the network they had uh, in 2019, but starting to look at new opportunities like Austin. And then there's some really good news stories throughout the pandemic. We've picked up some new airlines that have been that are turning out to be fantastic partners. So Singapore Airlines uh, started flying to Vancouver uh, during the pandemic, and it looks like they're going to be setting up permanently here. Um, Turkish Airlines started during the pandemic and have been doing very well since day one. Air India started direct service from Delhi, and they're looking to, to stay uh, permanently. And we have uh, JetBlue starting up here um, on JFK from uh, New York uh, next month as well and uh, Sun Country from Minneapolis. So, you know, we, we still have a ways to go here. Um, and then you also mentioned, Ingrid, uh, the growth of the low cost segment. So we're seeing a lot of expansion from airs like uh, from airlines like Flair um, and uh, Lynx. Um, so I, I do think that's another space to keep an eye on it as we see the leisure market segment of aviation uh, play a bigger role. I think that that is certainly a, a trend to keep a, keep a watch on here at YVR. Those new routes and destinations into the U.S. are incredible for us at this point. My goodness, like the the um, 
the opportunity that is connected with that. Both corporate, you know, when we think about all the different uh, segments that, that we need to, you know, be strong for full recovery. Uh, those are very, very encouraging uh, uh, announcements or relationships that you're developing. Thank you so much. Um, Allison, when you're looking out into your crystal ball and you're looking at recovery year over year, one of the questions that people are wondering about is um, when will the province be looking at actually a full recovery to pre-pandemic uh, levels? And I can tell you, we've got some destinations that have exceeded post-pandemic uh, numbers, and then many have not. So when we look at the whole compilation, uh, what are what are you seeing uh, from your research perspective, especially from the leisure market, because so much of it is international that supports the actual flow for properties over domestic? Uh, what are you what are your uh, anticipating recovery there? Yeah, no, wonderful question. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, all along, our, our research team working with a number of partners, Association Canada and around the province, right from sort of day one, has been tracking on scenarios, 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 scenarios. And our latest scenarios that we were working with and talked about in, in the spring, um, we kind of had sort of a conservative, a mid, and, and an aggressive. And I and we're that were tied to sort of the timing of the lifting of a variety of, of the COVID and the health restrictions um, being a key driver of being able to travel and being able to welcome back um, the international markets and with reduced test requirements. So we're tracking right now in, in what we were calling our, our mid scenario, which had been estimating sort of a, a full return to say 2019 industry levels, revenue levels by, by 2024. Um, but to your point, Ingrid, um, like we, as we heard, and I know Carrie you spoke about it as well, and um, there there are parts of the province right now where we've already been hearing anecdotally whether it's business on the books or you know the past week or so where they're starting to see those visitation levels um, already at or starting to softly exceed the 2019 levels um, but you made a really really great point is it's not going to be the same pathway uh, across all of the province and and even around the country um, I think as we know our our recovery path will look a little bit different than the rest of Canada because we have had a higher um, share of, of international visitors. So international uh, is, is really key to sort of that, that full recovery, which is why I think optimistically we're in that, that midterm scenario. And as you heard Russell mention, you know, with some of those, those markets that we are monitoring very, very closely, like China and Mexico, that still have some barriers to travel, um, certainly with, with China being a, a zero approach to COVID. Um, our teams are ready to go, but but it's just it's going to be sort of uh, a little bit more of that international visitation from those those traditional markets that I think is really going to push us over over the line to sort of those recoveries. So, yeah, happy to share more on that later. But that, that's what we're looking at. It's going to be a little bit different than the rest of Canada and around the province, just just based on whether it's a domestic or international mix um, for each of our, our destinations. Yeah, thank you. And Carrie, so much of the work that you and your team does is advising business development and looking at either refurbishment or new build or what kind of hotel should be built where and really advising the investment sector when it comes to building out to support uh, hotel development. Can you give us any insights as to what trends we're seeing now? What is the appetite you know, is there, are we seeing a growth in, in uh, price per door or per key? Is there, you know, is there any, mm. we have underbuilt markets that have been underbuilt for a long time. And then we have markets based on current demand that are really recognizing that they, they have capacity for additional builds. So do you have any insights that you'd like to share with us? Sure, sure. If you look at, um, if you look at the industry in general, when we, basically new development for hotels in Canada has always been fairly conservative. So we've never grown like we've seen our, our U.S. neighbors grow. Um, and it's really driven by the finance community. You know, you need to typically 60% to 70% of the, uh, the investment for a new hotel comes from a lender. 
And with a conservative lending environment, we've never grown um, our, the supply of hotels dramatically uh, in the country. And we've seen when we come out of cycles like this that it takes a while for the lending community to catch up. So, uh, you know, we, we don't anticipate a large amount of new supply uh, in the province, um, at least in the next few years, because you know, new projects are going to be challenging to get off the ground um, from a lending perspective. Uh, right now, I'm just sort of looking down the list. There's probably <clears throat> seven or eight hotels under construction uh, throughout the province. Um, we've got you know, three of those on the island, three of those in, in the Okanagan. Um, there's a, a property under construction up in Dawson Creek. Um, and then we've got a, a Delta Hotel associated with the Gateway Casino in, um, in Delta, BC. Uh, downtown Vancouver has a hundred rooms under construction in terms of the boutique space. So, you know, in the scheme of things, that's not a lot of rooms. And if you look at, at the, you know, the Fraser Valley specifically, I mean, that, that, that market is absolutely booming in terms of their performance numbers. They've had a lot of supply that's come out of the, the mix for, for social housing purposes. Um, so I think we will likely start to see developers move into areas like that, that um, you know, parts of Vancouver Island, parts of the Fraser Valley, uh, the, the city of Vancouver has made uh, it, it very well known pre-pandemic. And I think that the messaging must be out there now that we're coming out of the pandemic, because I know from our clients, we're, we're hearing a lot of people starting to consider incorporating hotel development into their projects in Vancouver. So most of the time in Vancouver, it's got to be something mixed use. You, you typically have to have another supportive use to go along with the hotel piece given the, the, the land values. But, you know, I would think that we'll start to see some projects come to fruition in, in downtown Vancouver. There'll be long time horizons. We're talking kind of late 2020s before we see those rooms built. Uh, the Broadway corridor will definitely see new development with what's going on with the, the transit in that area. And then uh, Oak Ridge, um, you know, there's, there's a lot that potentially could happen at Oak Ridge, uh, Richmond. So. You know, I, I do think that we will start to see more projects pop up, um, but the, the time horizons are not going to be something that uh, will impede the recovery for the existing hotels that need, you know, need to fill rooms. And, you know, one of the, one of the things that is a little bit interesting, kind of building on what, what Allison was just saying in terms of the timing of the recovery, um, you know, we, we're sort of aligned on that 2024. And if anything, I think we're, we're starting to see that that recovery might be even faster because the average room rates are recovering at a much quicker pace than normally happens coming out of a cycle. You often see that once you drop the rates to, to recover those rates back to historical levels, it takes a long time in the hotel space. And uh, that's not the case this year, or that's not the case in, the, you know, in this, this cycle. The, the US is driving um, significant growth. I was just looking at some, some luxury hotel numbers. You know, the, the rates in the luxury hotel segment compared to 2019 for the month of April we're up 40%. Mm. Um, so I think that will also help change the dynamics because if we get the rates to a position that construction becomes feasible, of, of course, you've got developers that, that want to, um, to do new projects. So yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, we, we certainly are seeing pockets around the province with very, very strong rates compared to the historical. And we're also hearing from many areas that hoteliers are having to cap occupancy because they don't have the workforce to service them. And so they're holding their rates, but you know, capping their occupancy, which you know, isn't, isn't a, a great scenario, but it's the best scenario if you don't have the workforce to actually service the rooms. You know, it's, it's a little bit, yeah, it's a little bit interesting. I was talking to an asset manager um, at, a, at a recent conference about that. You, in this restricted labor environment, um, where you you know you have challenges about cleaning rooms and you have to restrict, you start to you, you start to see uh, GMs and owners pricing things at a, a rate that they think is prohibitive to to demand coming in. That's right. And, and what they're saying what they're seeing is that the demand's coming in even at that rate that they thought they priced themselves out of. Yeah. Um, so we're kind of being able to t test that supply and demand curve and realizing, well, we're maybe we're a little. Uh, um, shy on the rate side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, <laughs> we're certainly witnessing that in several destinations right now. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that uh, has been a concern in recovery that we spoke in quite a bit of detail at, uh, at our conference is the, is the supply side. 
and the impact on the supply side, which is all of those service providers, whether it's transportation or in-market experience or the, you know, the local tour or the guide that will take you through a taste of Vancouver or, or into the Fraser Valley or the Okanagan. And the, the, because so many of those businesses, which I believe is more than 80%, are independently owned and operated and literally their demand uh, evaporated at the beginning of the pandemic, that there is a lag in actually the supply side to service the people that are coming in. And we're hearing about that in uh, resort destinations, rural destinations, and around the province. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a topic that any of you, you know, Russell or Allison or Carrie, that you'd like to comment on. But I do know that uh, if we're going to have a full recovery between now and if 2024 is the target, that there is going to have to be a significant amount of support and work made to make sure that we keep hold that that critical side of our business. Allison, I'm, I'm wondering if you might like to comment on that. Or Russell, I see that you might be, yeah. you might have a few uh, points as well. Sure, Russell, did you want to? Do you want to go first and I can maybe chime in? I'm more on the demand side in terms of the match between what we're seeing with the consumer trends and consumer behavior and, and what the, the today's traveler is looking for is continuing to be well, well aligned with what BC has to offer. Nature, urban, urban and nature so close to proximity, those, those deeper uh, cultural experiences, um, wanting to reconnect and, and you know the health effects that I think we all saw in the pandemic about getting into nature, which is you know the backbone of our, our BC effects campaign. So just from a demand side, I just I just wanted to comment that what we continue to offer um, from BC and, and what we're known for is what our today's post, well, this today's summer and fall traveler is is looking for. Um, but certainly having that depth of experience, um, it's a big, big opportunity and, and continue to work in partnership. I know we've had such amazing gains and partnerships and collaboration coming out of this, this pandemic and coming together to work together. But I think that's that real opportunity there. But supply is very, very important to recovery. Russ, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Allison. I 100% I agree. And, you know, I think about things like Indigenous tourism. So we know it was one of the fastest growing um, parts of our sector prior to the pandemic. Uh, we recently signed an MOU with Indigenous Tourism BC, uh, building on an MOU we have with Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada. So I really look forward to working, Allison, with your team at DBC on, on promoting those sorts of offerings. And I really believe the sorts of things and we see in the research, the sorts of things folks are going to want to do uh, coming out of the pandemic. So I 100% agree with you. Um, I think, Ingrid, you mentioned challenges around hiring and, and, and workforce. Um, I think that's a challenge across industry. I've just been at a two-day conference here in Victoria uh, with the BC Aviation Council, and we've been discussing everything, of course, from pilot shortages, but across industry mechanics. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do, I think, at the BCAC. Uh, so the, the um, uh, BC Aviation Council is doing a lot of work around scholarships and things to get uh, young folks into, in, into the industry uh, from a training perspective. So that's really important. And then another really important thing on Sea Island at YBR is, is getting, um, getting people hired. And, and we made an announcement recently on living wage at YBR. So all businesses on a Sea Island are gonna be required to, or at least uh, from the airport authority perspective, are gonna be required to be at living wage. And that, I think that's really important moving forward when we think of uh, cost of living rising uh, within, uh, within the lower mainland. So I, I really agree, Ingrid. I think this is a really important uh, topic for us moving forward as an industry. Yeah, um, thank you for that, Russell. And, you know, the last few days, and we were talking about this earlier, there's been quite a bit on the media around lineups and airports and travel and sort of that barrier or that experience of long haul travel. I just want to give you an opportunity to uh, cast a reality lens, uh, if you will. And I know, Carrie, you also just uh, traveled to the US and I just was traveling internationally as well. So can you just give us a little bit of an insight and, and uh, just tell us the work that you're doing and, and how you see that evolving uh, in the short run? Yeah, thank, thanks, Ingrid. We were talking about this with my uh, fellow panelists before we, we joined. Um, I'm at this conference, I'm at Victoria. I've been talking to a whole bunch of folks. So this is a little bit anecdotal. 
Um, but but a lot of the people who are transiting through Vancouver didn't have any issues uh, with CATSA. There, there were some stories of, of misconnections. I think there, there are staffing challenges that uh, CATS is working through right now. And a lot of that has to do with what's being witnessed in the, the hotel sector as well as trying to uh, bring, uh, bring staffing back. And CATSA is quite complicated because there's quite a, a training process and an exam process that folks need to go through. So they are working their way through it, uh, Ingrid. But as we were talking about earlier, um, I mean, there's a lot of stories out there in the media and, and there are uh, things we're working our way through, but, but it also depends on time of day and things. We have, we have a very busy period uh, at YBR right now around uh, 1 p.m. So a lot of the flights are coming in at that time. So we are encouraging um, uh, passengers to arrive much earlier in, uh, than they would have before, uh, get, given the challenges we're having. And it's just something we're gonna have to work uh, through this summer as, as we uh, see this hockey stick recovery. Yeah, you I, know, I, I would say my yeah, I've been traveling quite a bit in the last in the last few months and and have yet to have a a negative YVR experience. Um, you know, there you know, there's an expectation that you're gonna you're gonna see some sort of a lineup either at security or customs and, and immigration, but nothing nothing unrealistic. And um, but I, but I will say I don't think it's a a BC only problem. It it doesn't matter where you go. Service is not what it was before the pandemic, you know, we're down here in Las Vegas at a, at a conference and you, you can't do anything without a significant lineup and, and it's just um, everyone is stretched. So it's, uh, you know, ho hopefully we all start to figure out, you know, bring people back into our industry that we can, we can manage that to get the service back to what we, we used to enjoy. Yeah. I may want to put more thought there, uh, Carrie and Ingrid, is, is there are some new requirements that have been introduced into the travel process as a result of COVID. So the, the, the time it's taking to process passengers at CBSA and, and CATSA and things is going up. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there's still work to be done, I think, on, on, I don't know if unwinding is the right word, but, but revisiting some of the, the requirements that have been put in place throughout the pandemic as we start looking at the, the next normal here. Right, right. Well, I know for two years we were advocating with our partners in air and uh, federally as well as how we remove that friction at the border and you know some of it we become very familiar with and and I think some of it we, we continue to hope at some point will be removed and I'm sure that is a continuation of the challenge looking at the reality of safety security and then making sure that the border is as frictionless as possible I know myself, I always make sure that I have uh, my cone of patience on when I'm traveling and it seems to work quite well. <laughs> we appreciate that, Ingrid. Though. Yeah, <laughs> well, I love to travel, so I don't want to ruin my day by not being patient. Okay. Um, Ali, I'm wondering if you can give us any insights into the group tour uh, market that DBC, you, you know, uh, Maria and your team have been such a lead in developing those relationships and so many uh, properties in our sector are, um, you know, it, it's such an important piece of our business, whether it's the South Pacific in Australia or whether it's the long haul tours out of Germany and the UK. We know that China certainly will not be back until they've sort of got their COVID figured out. Uh, we know that Mexico was a market that, that uh, held enormous promise. And then, of course, the U.S. has been our number one uh, market in the tour and group sec uh, sector. Can you give us any insights specifically for tour of what you're seeing from the wholesalers and uh, what those trends are? Yeah, I certainly. Thanks, Ingrid. Sorry, I, um, I don't know if you heard that, but my, my boss was calling me, so I had to, I had to ignore his call. Um, <laughs> Good for you. I think you had a phone ringing in the background. Um, I can give you definitely a little insight, but certainly for, for any more specifics, you, you named the right people. Uh, Maria Green and Monica and their team, happy if there's any specific questions. If you, if you put them in the Q&A, if you leave your contact name, I'll be sure to make sure that um, Maria and Monica and their team follow up, um, but but we are seeing as you kind of as you suggested in, in your question is that there certainly is good interest in 2022, and what Maria's shared is the even stronger interest for 2023, and that's from the key markets. 
Um, as you've heard Russell speak to, obviously with the increases in, in air capacity that, that helps to fuel that, that, that driving of those bookings. Um, and as you know, UK, uh, some of those markets, um, they've been working heavily in, with the travel trade uh, for their holidays. So that's again, driving the return or the bookings of, of that group tour. So we know that those markets are traveling and are wanting to, to continue to, to travel is what we're seeing now. China is definitely a, a waiting game, um, but yeah, we've seen that demand pick up from, from the other markets. Um, and the team members will be at Rendezvous Canada this next week. Um, so if you don't see them there, uh, we certainly are looking for, forward to hearing what they learn and what's on the horizon that comes out of next week. And again, we'd be happy to share that out. But yeah, don't have much more specific stats in front of me, but definitely okay. happy to connect back with you on that. And uh, I know Marie would be happy, happy to provide any specific market insights or, or any other general questions. So yeah. yeah, Allison, I'm thinking maybe we'll reach out to Maria and then provide that in our communique that comes out uh, on Thursday or, or potentially next week if she'd like to put something together for us. I'm just going to the Q&A here. For those people that are uh, participating today in the virtual event, please feel free to pop a question in the Q&A. Um, Carrie, I have one here for you. How do you think cities, so downtown areas and airport areas are going to fare this summer? Well, they're our largest hotel markets. Um, and so they need the, the all segments to have fired back up to have true recovery. Um, and you can look right across Canada. Um, we're, we're seeing the overall number up um, in terms of performance for the country, but it's it's not being driven by our downtown markets. Our downtown markets are the ones that are are taking the longest to recover. Um, Vancouver is a bright spot if you if you look at the major markets, compare it to Toronto or compare it to um, to Montreal. Uh, but it's not going to see the um, the full recovery this summer. I don't believe. Um, you know, we've, it's, it's wonderful to see cruise ships back in the harbor and, um, you know, see uh, Elon Musk and, and Bill Gates coming to town to do TED and, and these kind of things. So there's, I think we're starting to see the vibrancy come back. Um, and, I, you know, I think we have to realize we, we've had some challenges that have happened to our downtown core over the last couple of years that have made it not as desirable uh, or feeling as safe for, for tourists. Um, so I think there's a reality check that we need to do is that uh, we want to get these these travelers back. We need to make sure that our downtown cores are uh, are what we want them to be. Um, yeah. You know, air, airport market. It, again, it if you're not at 100% recovery in the the passenger traffic coming through the airport, uh, we're not we're not going to see full recovery in the hotel market a, a adjacent to it. Um, but certainly the numbers look a lot better than than they had in previous years. Yeah, I'm very encouraged with the initiatives that are being announced by. Uh, the city of Vancouver and the initiatives that are partnering with the hotel sector, but we do, you're absolutely right, and we're hearing that all the time, you know, we really need to roll up our sleeves and figure out that whole piece of, uh, the, you know, feeling safe, having a great, vibrant downtown, and a lot of that is regenerating that demand, so there are people coming and going, and patios open, and, you know, there's that vibe that, that uh, the city centers are so well known for, and we certainly know international travelers are very interested in a vibrant city experience, so, you know, I think we all have a role to play there. And, um, you know, the faster we get to it, uh, the better off I think we'll all be. Um, Allison, I have a question here that I'm thinking you may be able to answer. The importance of the farm to plate concept was very well understood by every restaurant in BC during the pandemic. You know, mm. uh, the, the restaurant sector did a very, very good job of um, really tying to themselves to their local neighborhood. You know, you had your your favorite chef and your favorite restaurant and your favorite bartender and people really came to the table and supported them. Um, do you have insights as to how, uh, when we look at the support that we provided for sort of domestic and BC travel, this question really is, how do we encourage and tie that hotel sector to the restaurant sector and adopt that concept for British Columbia, which really goes into all of that uh, regenerative tourism and the sustainability piece as well? 
Yeah, yeah, great, great question. Um, and uh, yeah, I was just going to say that, you, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head in terms of the local flavors or, or, or using local goods or the sto storytelling that's woven into hotels and restaurants um, or, or even the experience sector that's, that's showing that local is very, very sought after um, from, our, from our travelers. And, and that's the type of experiences and those local experiences that they're, they're looking for, those, those deeper connections, meaningful travel. And you're right, it is certainly very much tied to this, the renewal of our industry and um, you know, contributing to the, the well-being of our British Columbians, who are, as you said earlier, 80% are small business owners um, that, that make up the space of our, our industry. Um, so it's really bringing in and embracing those ideas of sustainability and, and, and stewardship. So not only does it make a lot of sense for supporting community, um, you know, building back those business ties and supply chains within a community between the restaurant sector and the hotel sector as you mentioned. Um, it also is, is matched with what we're seeing as, as the type of um, travel behaviors that's being uh, and experiences that, are, that is being sought after um, out there by the consumers who are being more mindful. I think the pandemic as well has kind of really accelerated um, people's um, called for sustainability or providing, you know, spending travel dollars wisely so that it's providing benefit into the local communities that they're visiting, those host destinations, and the more ways that they're able to purchase local um, gifts, artisans, crafts, and, and the stories and learning about the stories that are tied behind it. I think that's really what we're seeing continue to fuel this idea of regenerative tourism. Um, and the stewardship. Um, it's certainly something Destination BC, um, it, we have as, as part of our corporate strategy. We believe that it transcends all of our work. I know it was an amazing time. I saw you at Impact Travel uh, Conference just last week. Um, but it, yeah, we really believe that that stewardship regenerative approach is, is the foundation and it, and it needs to weave into all that, that we're doing. So kind of thinking, I think about the, the benefits that tourism brings, not only on an economic standpoint, but, but thinking of it beyond, you know, supporting our, our business partners, our communities, the cultural impact and those social well-being. And, and so Certainly, um, reducing our impact or managing our impact on the environment as well. So that those are yeah really areas that, in the longer term, what we're planning for as well is how to continue to support the industry, and it's also supported through the province and and their economic plan. It's about clean and inclusive growth, so more more than just um, revenue growth. Right, right. Allison, I have a question and, and Carrie and, and Russell, I'm thinking both of you may have some insights here. Uh, one of the questions in the Q&A is about the Alberta market. And, you know, one of my favorite areas in the province is the Kootenai Rockies region, and they have very, very strong demand from Alberta, uh, both winter and summer. Uh, but the Alberta market is critical to the whole of British Columbia. So are we seeing uh, any uh, trends or do we have any insights? The, the question itself is, how are we going to get the Albertans past the Kootenai Rockies region? But I actually think when you're talking about that whole uh, immersive travel experience in the province of British Columbia, do you see Alberta responding the way that it has historically, which is our best neighbor, which means, you know, strongest domestic demand? Or are we seeing some uh, changes there? And Russell, I'm thinking about the number of flights and that partnership between, you know, it's sort of, I, I believe we call it either uh, uh, co opetition or uh, frenemies uh, with Calgary. And likewise, uh, what is going on with the, you know, the dueling markets between Vancouver and Calgary. But, you know, the regions like the Kootenai Rockies uh, are very well poised to be that authentic story-based uh, tourism experience. Uh, do any of you would like to comment on the Alberta market? I might start if that's okay. Ingrid, I, I, you know, I, I sit on, I, yes, is there sometimes some 
competi friendly competition amongst uh, ourselves and our, our peers at our airports across the country. A little bit, but I but I, I sit on all kinds of uh, groups with with my friends in Calgary and, and Edmonton and elsewhere. And I really do think, as a country, we're much better off when we're working together um, in partnership, as Allison was uh, mentioning earlier. And, and I do think there's a huge opportunity there, as you were mentioning, Ingrid, or, or not a huge opportunity. I mean, it, it, it's a big. It's a big part of the tourism offer, I think, when folks can come into Vancouver and then do stuff through the Rockies and depart out of, out of, out of Calgary or, or vice versa. So I think it, I think it's more about cooperation, partnership, um, catering to what it, what it is the visitor wants when when they come. And, and I think we we're, we're see when we were looking at uh, recovery, certainly it was domestic that led the way, and certainly it was our friends in Alberta that were were big uh, visitors uh, uh, last uh, summer. And I really and I really think there's lots of opportunity for more of that in the future and then we are seeing more capacity from calgary and from edmonton and we are seeing new entrants into the market like flair and links who are, are you know who arguably will, will provide um uh fares at a level that will stimulate more visitation um in our respective provinces so i, I think this is i think this is a really i think i think it is more about um, cooperation and partnership and, and working together yeah you know so true i i i, I often say that um, you know, the competition is not in your own community and it's not up the road either. And it's probably not in the province. If we're really looking at growing share, you know, you, you have to look at uh, way beyond that. It's, it's, not a, it's not a local environment if we're all building the demand mechanisms. Yeah. And certainly from our marketing perspective, um, as I mentioned, domestic Alberta, key, key market on our domestic efforts. Um, and they were a key market um, for our spring campaign, uh, which you may have saw and is in market until May 27th, um, which is funny. It's explore BC, let's do something together. Um, so again, of all about that, that togetherness. And yeah, because we do have a lot of uh, residents that are, we're really trying to push that urgency of that spring trip, but that spring trip to BC, reconnect with your family, your friends, your favorite places, um, and do something unforgettable together. So it's that what was that was really the, the essence of the spring campaign, which is still in market. We won't be doing um, domestic marketing because we know from our partnership and working really closely together that there is a lot um, of CD, of our communities and our regions and even Destination Canada that are supporting that summer travel. So our teams are already looking at, again, that next shoulder season the fall, um, where again, and Alberta and our, our, our friends there will, will be a, a target market, I would anticipate for that, that fall shoulder season as well. Yeah. And I know, Carrie, we have many ownership groups, uh, franchise companies, uh, et cetera, that have multi-properties between our, our two provinces. You know, there, there's a lot of shared uh, business investment and, and equity uh, between the two provinces. And I'm sure you're seeing that that uh, remains so. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and I think the, you know, the, the reality is that Alberta is now in a better position with with what oil prices have done in the last little while. These companies are making money again, and um, and so there's there's wealth that's being generated in Alberta, and, and you know, BC is the playground. You know, you look to a, a market like um, Courtney Comox that has great service between Calgary and that market, and it is just. Um, exceptional numbers coming out yeah. of there and and we into the shoulder months um, that you wouldn't typically expect it so you know uh, November and, a, and a, a February that might be typically softer with the way the conditions are right now the domestic market wants to find somewhere to go and and most of the time that means looking west to whether it's the island or the Okanagan or, or uh, somewhere in, in greater Vancouver yeah well, we are looking at the clock here and we only have a few more minutes to go. So I'd like each of you as the panelists, final comments, uh, sort of your, your last insights that you'd like to share. Russell, uh, let's start with you. All right, great. I, uh, I'd like to pick up on something Allison was talking about just around sustainability and climate. It's, it's, it's a huge focus for us at uh, YVR. When our new CEO, Tamara, came in, we made a very um, bold uh, pledge on, on 23 net, our 2030 net zero targets. So we're putting a lot of uh, time and attention into that, everything from electrification of our fleets to um, uh, better ways of cooling and heating our buildings and things. And I, I just think it's a really, really important topic for us as we look towards recovery here and getting out ahead of it as an industry. I've, as I mentioned, I've just spent the last two days at a really, really, really good conference here in Victoria with a bunch of my colleagues, uh, different airports across the province, but uh, folks uh, from 
uh, Harbor Air and uh, Pacific Coastal and HeliJet and others. And I, I'm, I'm optimistic about our ability to, to make a, to, to come out of this, uh, I think the tagline was a cleaner, greener and keener industry. Um, so, so it's something YBRs can be very focused on and I think very important for our industry moving forward. Thank you. That's uh, very exciting indeed, Russell. I know the hotel sector is equally uh, committed. I, th I think huge opportunities with our, with our industries in, in that realm. Uh, Allison. Yes, wonderful. Um, well, I guess sort of two things. I, I had a chance to look at the, some of the questions that came in uh, during registration, which there was a number of great ones. So just to make a plug, I think, for the Hotel Association's own publication, I know there was an article recently in April, and I believe there might be one coming up in the summer that can provide some of the insights that were being asked that we didn't get a chance to talk about today. And then lastly, I think I'd just love to re-highlight, and this panel is an example of it, um, this this uh, what we've been talking about the new partnerships and the collaborations um, we've we've seen it and we've heard it from from others around the, the country that this this team BC approach that has really been successful um, throughout the pandemic um, is is a bit of our, our our province's secret sauce and that working to together to ensure that we're not over marketing because we know who's doing what that we're sharing information that that our business and operators feel like they know that where they can go for assistance or help um, this this whole idea of the continued collaboration and partnership is just um, really going to think reinforce our success and and also lead us to that stronger uh, recovery um, yeah and I think you mentioned it that coopetition is is really I think the the mindset that's out there let's let's really work together we've done some amazing work with ITBC um, in our own marketing and it's just putting us in a in a much better place in the marketplace because we're just yeah, partners and, and really distinct. So that's sort of what I would say as a closing comment. Thank you, Allison. And Carrie. I would say, you know, the, the hotel industry is a, it's a notoriously cyclical industry. Um, and we, I think we have clear vision that we're, we're at the beginning of a new cycle. Um, so taking that time and, and strategically thinking about where you you want to be in your hotel and in your operation for the next um, seven, eight, ten. Hopefully, you know maybe we get more than ten years in this cycle uh, in an upward because you know we've we've got a lot of this demand that's come and visited certain places for the first time. They've been patient because it's COVID and and um, but they won't be patient forever. We're going to have to be competitive, so we need to look at the facilities that are being operated what's the what's the reinvestment plan within within your hotel and what's the service plan within your hotel so that those guests that we captured um, because of these conditions are going to stay and and um, you know propagate on from from there so yeah um, yeah I would I would take this time to realize that we're, we're at the beginning of this new cycle and there's a lot of opportunity to come yeah, yeah, I fully agree with you there, Carrie. It's an exciting time. I think, uh, you know, there's some caution. Uh, I think uh, two years of being cautious and having, uh, you know, all of that experience behind us, uh, we're all ready to really ramp up. But you're absolutely right. I think investment, physical plant, service, uh, training, development, sustainability, partnerships, there's, there's a lot that we can do and to really leverage all of our long-term success. I'd like to really thank each of you for joining us today. Uh, I know uh, the conversation's been very contributory. Um, I just want to let everybody know that our next virtual event is the 2030 Olympic bid. And so we'll bring that to you in June and uh, in partnership with the BC 2030 Project Feasibility Team. Super exciting. We all remember 2020, uh, the Olympics of 2010, very, very fondly. We also will be bringing to you some information sessions for operators and independent hotels, especially on Bill 10. What does that mean for you? And really putting together some key best practices. So please stay tuned for that. I'd also just like to remind you, Allison at bcha.com is your workforce uh, partner uh, and uh, recruitment partner. Uh, I saw a few questions in the Q&A about hiring and uh, please do reach out to Allison directly. She's here to support you and we have all kinds of solutions 
So uh, don't hesitate. That's uh, Allison with one L at bcha.com. And I'm Ingrid Jarrett, and you can reach out to me anytime as well, Ingrid at bcha.com. Just like to thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for your time. And thank you for your commitment to our industry. Allison, Carrie, Russell, my personal thanks for joining.